Welcome back. It was a crime which pushed everything else off the front pages. Three men, all known criminals, found shot dead in the Essex countryside. It was a cold-blooded professional killing. The victims had many enemies, but which one wanted them executed? And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Supergrass Darren Nichols is waiting for the hitman's bullet after giving evidence in the trial of one of Britain's most brutal gangland slayings. The Mole astonished murder squad detectives by breaking cover to point the finger at the killers in the notorious Rettendon triple murders. Last week, his sensational evidence convicted thugs Michael Steele and Jack Wombs for the cold-blooded ambush of three rival drug dealers. Speaking for the first time since his dramatic decision to turn informer, Mechanic Nichols described how he is now coping with life as the target of a £250,000 assassin's contract. Nichols said, it was either them or me. I was the only witness to what they had done. They realised that and I was told my days were numbered. Up until the trial, detectives gave Nichols a 24-hour armed guard and his family were put up in a series of safe houses. Crack officers from the Essex Police Armed Protection Unit shadowed his every move for fear he would be killed before giving evidence. Last week, an Old Bailey jury convicted Steele, 55, and henchman Wombs, 36, of the execution-style murders on the strength of Nichols' statement. His evidence in the witness box was the only link between the pair and the killings of the trio as they sat in their Range Rover on an isolated Essex farm track. They had been lured to the country spot with the promise of a lucrative cocaine drop from a plane passing overhead but the victims had driven into a trap and were blasted to death in revenge for a gangland bust-up. Nichols said, quote, When it was all over, I could not believe what they were saying. It was just too horrible for words. Steele said he was doing the world a favour by doing this, and at one point he said he felt like the angel of death. When Wombs jumped into the back seat, I could see he was wearing white surgical gloves which were covered in blood. He was joking about Mick's gun falling apart during the hit, and Steele just said, they won't be threatening me again. My mouth went dry and my mind was racing. I was still in shock, but I just had to get out of there. I could hardly speak, but I tried to stay on their good side and said to them, I hope I never fall out with you. The discovery of the blood splattered Range Rover the following morning sparked one of the biggest inquiries Essex police have dealt with. The investigation and subsequent nine week trial is said to have cost more than 1.5 million pound. But until Nichols agreed to give his crucial evidence, Detectives were baffled. Ivan Dibley was just four months away from retiring when he was plunged into the biggest case of his career. Former Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, 52, said, Early on I had the hunch that whoever had gone down the lane with the three was trusted by them. I suspected he had lured them to the scene where somebody else could have been waiting. If that was right, then I guess there would also be a getaway driver. Teams who commit major crimes rarely, if ever, drive themselves away from the scene. We asked Rolf's partner, Donna Jaggers, if she had any ideas who the killer could be. She revealed the men had been going to meet somebody called Mickey the Pilot, the nickname of Michael Steele. When we checked Steele's telephone records, we found a series of calls to Jack Wombs. Wombs and Steele had also called Darren Nichols. He turned out to be the driver. I believed that if we could get enough evidence to bring in the getaway driver, he would crack. The victims, Pat Tate, 37, Tony Tucker, 38, and Craig Rolfe, 26, drove to the isolated track in Rettendon near Basildon after Steele promised a share in a cocaine drop. They believed the invite marked the end of a feud. Nichols told how Steele regularly smuggled cannabis into the country across the channel from the coast of Belgium. But in November 1995, a £70,000 deal between Steele and Tate turned sour when Tate accused the suppliers of giving him poor quality cannabis. Nichols said, quote, Pat Tate was furious he'd been given a substandard batch. He was angry because he knew he needed his customer's confidence. Tate demanded his cash back and after much haggling with the supplier in Amsterdam, Steele got it for him. 
but Steele discovered that one third of the haul was fine and Tate had sold it on and made a profit. Tate was also putting it about that Steele hadn't paid back the money and he said he would make him admit it before shooting him dead. The countdown to the executions had begun. On the afternoon of December the 6th, 1995, Nichols received a call on his mobile phone from Steele asking him to meet him. Quote, I linked up with Steele and Wombs outside a motorbike shop in a village outside Colchester, said Nichols. I joined Steele in his Toyota and we set off with Wombs following behind. I knew something awful was going to happen. We went to the car park of the halfway house pub where Steele told us to find a space where we could watch him but couldn't be seen. Tate arrived in the Range Rover with Rolf and Tucker. That was our signal to head off to the farm track. As Wombs lay in wait in a bush at the top of the track 20 miles away, Steele climbed into Rolf's Range Rover to steer the three into the ambush. Shortly after 6.45pm, the F-Reg motor turned down the track and pulled up at a locked gate. Steele left the vehicle on the pretext of opening the gate. Wombs stepped out of the darkness and the carnage began. The driver, Rolf, is believed to have been the first man to die with a shot to his head. In a fraction of a second, Wombs' pump-action shotgun was aimed at Tucker, sitting in the front passenger seat. He fired one shot into his face, killing him instantly. Behind him sat Tate. He was found shot in the stomach and head. The Old Bailey judge, the Honourable Mr Justice Anthony Hidden, jailed the pair for life, recommending that they serve a minimum of 15 years. He told them, you are extremely dangerous men who had not the slightest compunction for resorting to violence when you thought it was necessary. Since last week's trial, Nichols has been moved to another secret address with his police guard stepped up. He has also tried to dramatically change his appearance by wearing women's underwear. The following newspaper article is from the 21st of the 1st, 1998, with the headline, Mum has no hate for killers. Lorraine McCrow says she has no hate for the killers of her youngest son, Craig Rolfe. She admitted, quote, I do have a lot of anger, but I can honestly say I don't have any hate in me. I never have. Mrs McCrow of Beanbridge Pitsy heard the pathologist tell the old Bailey about Rolfe's horrendous head wounds. They had been inflicted by ruthless killer Jack Wombs, who had fired a shotgun into his head at point-blank range. However, medical experts say Rolf wouldn't have had time to know what was happening. She said, quote, It was vicious the way they died. Craig didn't deserve it. But when I heard how quick it was, that did put my mind at rest. Mrs. McCrow remained on friendly terms with Wom's mother, Pam, throughout the trial. She said, quote, There was no point in falling out. I would bring her copies of the Echo because she didn't get to see it. I was very close to Craig. He was the youngest, the baby of the family. I saw him near enough every day. As far as I knew, he was working for Tony on the security side. I called him a gopher. Tony supplied security men to the stars, and that's what attracted Craig. He was on a high living that lifestyle. But I don't blame Tony for his death. Pat Tate was responsible. If he hadn't come on the scene, they would have been alive today. When the plumed horses rumbled to a halt, pulling the elaborate coffin behind them, the vicar was waiting on the Pitsy Church steps. The Reverend Laurie Blaney was there that winter morning to carry out the funeral service of gangland villain and cocaine addict Craig Rolfe. He admitted afterwards, quote, There were some real mafioso types there. Some of them even had camel hair coats. It did make me feel very careful what I said during the service, I had to strike a balance between a tribute to the dead man and remembering what he was said to have done. But the family seemed happy afterwards. The service was at St Gabriel's Church and a cortege of 20 cars followed the horse-drawn glass carriage carrying the coffin from his mother's house in Beanbridge. The Reverend Blaney relayed sentiments from Rolf's girlfriend and Rolf's mother Lorraine McCrow. The floral tributes were large and plentiful. One spelt out, my son Craig in white flowers. Another was designed like a book and read, You are not gone until you are forgotten, and we will never forget you. The simple message was followed by four kisses. His seven-year-old daughter had sent one shaped like an angel. The next day was the turn of Tate and Tucker. The pair, who had been inseparable in life, were buried apart. Tate in Pitsy Cemetery next to Rolf, 
and Tucker Upminster. A flower-decked, horse-drawn carriage led the way for Tate's funeral and police directed traffic as a bell tolled for the 25-minute service, which a brother gave a touching tribute. One floral tribute said simply, Daddy. A Cardus Hatch said, Thanks for the good times, I will never forget you, your baby son. Around 60 mourners sang all things bright and beautiful and recited the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd. Tucker's burial took place with no less ceremony. This time, a limousine ferried the body to a service which more than 100 people attended. Many were doormen who had worked for him. Now Tate's and Rolf's headstones nestle side by side in the peace and serenity of Pitsy Cemetery. Tate's has all the ostentation of his funeral service and carries a photograph. It reads, Treasured memories of Pat Terence Tate who departed this life on December the 6th, 1995, aged 37. Loving father, loyal friend and brother. Missing your smiles and generous heart. Your presence will never leave us. Now you walk with the angels looking down from God's great kingdom. Until we meet again, God bless, we will never forget you. On its base, two white doves comfort each other and the back of the memorial reads, God found the path was growing rough, the hill too steep to climb, so he closed your eyelids and whispered peace be thine. Rolf's is more subdued and reads simply, in loving memory of a dear son, brother and father, Craig Anthony Rolf, who was taken from us December the 6th, 1995, aged 26. His life a beautiful memory, his absence a silent grief. Tucker's has a pair of boxing gloves, a tribute to his association with Nigel Benn engraved in gold. There is also a photo of the drug baron laughing. A poem from his girlfriend Anna Whitehead reads, So many things I want to say. I miss you in so many ways. I long to have you hold me tight through the empty days and lonely nights. In my dreams I see your face, so special you can't be replaced. I'll treasure all my memories of everything you were to me, and one sweet day we'll meet again. Till then my life is filled with pain, you are truly one of a kind to know and love. I was blessed, you are in my heart always, the best. On a separate outcrop is a message from his mum. Another remembers the sad death of his father Ronald, who died of a heart attack when he heard the news of his son's murder. The following newspaper article is from the 21st of the 1st, 1998, with the headline, Drug Deals That Led to Death. Something as insignificant as a batch of dodgy cannabis was to spell death for Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. At the beginning of November 1995, Tate gave £70,000 to his old pal Michael Steele, who had regularly been ferrying cannabis across the North Sea, aided by Jack Wombs and Peter Corey. Darren Nichols, who was the star prosecution witness in the court case, revealed he and Corey would buy the drugs from John Stone, who ran Stone's Caf in Amsterdam, Holland. Then the pair would travel to Blankenberg in Belgium, and in scenes straight out of a spy novel, using torches and walkie-talkies, they would signal to steal in his inflatable boat. During that last drug importation worth £120,000, the tension behind Tate and Steele began to mount, and the trip was dogged by disaster. Steele discovered Tate's £70,000 was around £200 short, staff at Eurocar in Amsterdam refused to take cash for a vehicle Nichols had hired, and his credit card was over its limit. Nichols and Corey nearly missed Steele on the beach after going the wrong way. Corey accompanied Steele in a boat, but Nichols missed the last ferry home. Steele landed the drugs at Point Clear near Clacton, but was later arrested with Wombs by customs officers who spotted the boat. The officers searched Steele and discovered an electronic organiser. On it was logged the telephone numbers of Wombs, Tucker, Tate, Stone's Calf and Peter Corey, but no charges were brought. The situation deteriorated further when the drugs turned out to be dud. Tate was fuming. Andrew Monday QC prosecuting said, There was pride at stake. Steele had lost face. He was the importer but now had to admit that what he'd imported was rubbish. Tate was furious. 
Steele and Nichols travelled back to Amsterdam for a refund and after much haggling were given the sum back in full. They hoped to catch a train to Ostend where they planned to meet Tate and give him back his share but were followed to the station, probably by Stone's men. After dodging their pursuers they hailed a taxi to Ostend at a cost of £400, leaving Steele badly out of pocket. The date was now November the 16th 1995 and Tate was waiting in Ostend with pals including Craig Rolfe and Barry Dorman, the owner of Eastern Garages in Fobbing. Mr Dorman had given Tate £10,000 for the deal, believing he was going to buy a car. Tate got his cash back and returned to Basildon. But greed prompted him to tell those who had loaned him the £70,000 that Steele hadn't paid up. To bolster his story, Tate threatened to make Steele admit it on his knees, then he, Tate, would shoot him dead. Still was further enraged to learn that one third of the dud cannabis had been saleable. His investigations showed Tate had received that third and probably sold it. Another point of tension between the former friends was Steele's fondness for Tate's ex-girlfriend Sarah Saunders. Mr Monday said, quote, It appears Tate wasn't behaving very well towards her. Steele and his partner Jackie Street, no doubt out of loyalty, were seeking to assist her. Still decided the only way to deal with Tate was to kill him. The Supergrass who helped nail the Rettenden murderers has spoken for the first time about his secret life under police protection. Darren Nichols, 33, who formerly lived in Braintree, but who has now been given a new identity under the Witness Protection Program, lives in constant fear of being tracked down by supporters of killers Michael Steele and Jack Wombs. It was Nichols' crucial testimony which led to the conviction of Steele 56 of Angers Green, Great Bentley, and Wombs 37 of Suffolk at the Old Bailey last year. They were found guilty of gunning down rival drug barons Pat Tate 37, Tony Tucker 38, and Craig Rolfe 26, whose bodies were found inside a Range Rover in Workhouse Lane, Rettenden. Nichols was the getaway driver who confessed his role to the police in May 1996 when he was arrested for possession of drugs. He is still waiting for the final details of his new identity to slip into place. But because his former identity has been erased, including national insurance number, passport and driving licence, and his new one has yet to be established, he can't even get a job. He said, quote, At the moment, I'm just getting used to being at home. It was nice to get back to normality. Well, to be with my family anyway. The place I'm living is so peaceful compared to Braintree. It's a different pace of life, and I feel like a retired person, without the pension. The police will help me find employment, but it's difficult to know what to do. The fear he might be tracked down by Wombs and Steele's associates is always on his mind. Wombs and Steele's second bid to seek leave to appeal was turned down by a High Court judge last week. Essex police were today locked in discussions with television programme makers in an effort to make last minute changes to a documentary about Supergrass Nichols. Senior officers are said to be unhappy about certain parts of an inside story programme due to be aired tomorrow night. In the programme, Nichols tells of his life after the Rettenden murders. Police are said to be anxious that parts of the documentary may lead to his identification. If the programme is to be aired on BBC One at 10.15pm tomorrow, key changes to blur his identity look set to be made. Nichols' story will soon be told in a book, Blogs 19, by crime writer Tony Thompson. It tells the story of how he met Wombs, Steele and Tate in prison through to the present day. Blogs 19 was the name given to Darren when he was held in a special supergrass wing in HMP Woodhill in Bedfordshire. Blogs 19 will hit the bookshelves in the spring, published by Little Brown and priced at $5.99. The following newspaper article is from the 21st of the 1st, 1998, with the headline, Brinks Matt Robber Tate's Pow. The Enforcer was the chilling nickname given to bodybuilder Pat Tate when he became minder to Brinks Matt Robber Kenny Noy in jail. Other inmates at Swaleside Prison in Kent were terrified of displeasing Noy when they realised they faced retribution from Tate. Noy was inside for his part in the multi-million pound gold bullion robbery in the early 80s. Tate had been in jail for a series of armed robberies. Noy, who is wanted for questioning over the road rage murder of Stephen Cameron, stabbed on the M25, was keen to cash in on crime while in prison. 
Tate allegedly persuaded Neu to put up £30,000 to finance an operation manufacturing ecstasy in Holland and smuggling it into Britain. He promised Neu a guaranteed 100% plus profit and Neu eventually scooped £70,000. The following newspaper articles from the 27th of the 4th, 1998, with the headline My Husband Did Not Kill Drug Barons Michael Steele and Jack Wombs have served more than a year behind bars for the triple killing of three drug barons at Rettenden. Families of both men claim they are innocent and say the prosecution's star witness, Supergrass Darren Nichols, told a bunch of lies. Nigel Brown talked to Steele's wife about the long battle to clear her husband's name. Jackie Street is exploring every avenue in her bid to get husband Michael released, including an application to the European Court of Human Rights. Steele, 56, who lived in St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, and Wombs, 36, of Main Road, Brockford, Suffolk, both got triple life sentences for the murders of drug barons Pat Tate, Craig Rolfe and Tony Tucker down a country lane in Rettendon in December 1995. But Mrs Street claims they were innocent, quote, We are looking at every possible channel we can. They did not commit these murders and both Michael Steele and Jack Wombs protest their innocence. Michael is determined and absolutely resolute that the truth will eventually come out and he will never give up. Mrs Street, who still lives in the tendering area but does not want to reveal exactly where, has come forward to speak for the first time since the trial. She is concerned a new film, Essex Boys, which is being shot across Essex and is loosely based on the Rettenden murders, will do nothing to help her husband's cause. The film and the fact that Michael and Jack's names are being connected with this just further concretes the view they are guilty, she said. Mrs Street said they were also angry the BBC programme Inside Story, which she claimed included important new evidence, was prevented from being screened earlier this year when Darren Nichols successfully applied for an injunction. He has been given a new identity by police and a High Court judge agreed there were scenes in the documentary which could lead to his whereabouts being revealed. Steele and Wombs have been refused leave to appeal, but Steele has put a case against his own legal representation before the legal ombudsman. If it is found he was not properly represented, then he will have leave to appeal, added Mrs Street. The ombudsman has to go through the entire trial and we should know his decision in about four months. She said an application was also being made to the Criminal Cases Review Committee, the European Courts and private prosecutions were being considered against certain police officers. Mrs Street believes her husband is innocent. She said she was shopping with him on the evening of the murders and then they returned home to Great Bentley to show a couple around the house they were selling. I know he is no saint. I also know he did not murder these three men. She added, He has committed a number of crimes in the past and he has paid for them. The evidence is there that he is innocent but we just need someone to listen. Steele was first sent to prison in 1964 and is now serving his sixth sentence. In 1990, he was sentenced to nine years for importing drugs, but was released in 1993 on police license. Three men were shot in the head as they sat in a car after apparently being lured to a remote farm track in Essex. The men, thought to be criminals, were found shortly before 8am yesterday. A farmer and his friend were going to feed their pheasants at White House Farm Rettenden near Chelmsford when they discovered the blue seven-year-old Range Rover with the men slumped inside. The identities of the men, all believed to come from South Essex and details of their previous convictions, were not disclosed. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who is leading the investigation into what is believed to be a gangland killing, said, quote, It was not an ordinary murder. It appears that they were enticed to go down the lane or an arrangement was made for them to be there. Shotgun cartridges were found in the snow near the car, which was parked 250 yards down Workhouse Lane. The track runs from the main south end to Chelmsford Road to a private fishing lake. Police believe the men were shot at point-blank range in the car. The murderer, possibly with an accomplice, is then understood to have driven away. We don't know if we're looking for one perpetrator or two, Mr Dibley said. We also don't know whether somebody arrived in the same vehicle as the victims or came in their own. The track in which a hijacked lorry was dumped several years ago was so narrow that police were unable to take the bodies from the Range Rover to carry out a post-mortem examination. Instead, the men, all white and aged between 20 and 40, were left inside the car. 
The vehicle was covered with a green tarpaulin and taken to South Woodham Ferrers for examination six hours after the bodies were found. Peter Theobald, the farmer who found the bodies, and his friend Ken Jiggins, a bricklayer, thought that the Range Rover belonged to fishermen when they saw it blocking the track. We were driving down the farm track to feed the birds, Mr Jiggins 44 said. The Range Rover was parked close to a locked gate which leads to the lake. We thought that perhaps it was a fisherman, but they have their own key, so I got out, walked up to the Range Rover and tapped on the window and told them to move it. There was no response. I looked in and then walked back to Peter and told him that there were two people in there who, by the looks of it, had been shot dead. Peter then got out of the car, walked up to the vehicle, he looked in and said, there's one in the back as well. We got hold of the police and told them what we had seen. People living nearby said they heard nothing on Wednesday night or early yesterday morning. Ron Foe, owner of Rettenden Hall, said, quote, We are shooting people. It would not be that unusual to hear guns at night. People go lamping for rabbits and foxes. We are into shotguns, but we heard nothing. The following newspaper article is from the 8th of December 1995 with the headline, Hitman Swap Sides. Three drug dealers found shot dead yesterday were savagely executed by a hitman who changed sides. Craig Rolfe and Patrick Tate went out with Tony Tucker to meet the contract killer and fix the death of a rival they believed had grasped on them. But in an amazing twist, the assassin had already been paid an estimated £20,000 by their target to blow them away. As the three men sat in their seven-year-old Range Rover parked down an isolated farm track at Rettenden, Essex, the gunman stealthily approached through the snow. Then, possibly joined by a second hitman, he opened up through the near-side rear window with a pump-action sawn-off shotgun nearly blasting their heads off. The men were only identified by police fingerprint files. A CID source said yesterday, quote, It was a brilliantly executed assassination. The victims were lured to the lane to discuss having someone else hit, but the tables were turned on them. They drove into an ambush and were shot to pieces. A source at Essex Police added, quote, We had excellent information that Rolf and Tate have been trying to hire a killer to rub out a rival drug dealer. But it seems the intended victim got his shot in first. Tucker was a power and minder of Dark Destroyer boxing hero Nigel Benn. Tate had a conviction for armed robbery. Rolf also had a robbery conviction. They died as a direct result of the police war on drug dealers following the tragic death of ecstasy girl Leah Betts 18 last month. Their intended victim pushed ecstasy in Raquel's nightclub at Basildon, where Leah's fatal tablet is believed to have been bought. The bodies were discovered at breakfast time yesterday by farmer Peter Theobald, 44, and farm worker Ken Jiggins, 47. The pair stumbled on the death wagon in tree-lined workhouse lane near Mr Theobald's farm on the main A130 Chelmsford to Basildon Road as they set out to feed pheasants. The metallic blue Range Rover, registration F424NPE, was parked tight up against a five-bar gate and hidden from the road by trees. Ken said, quote, The car was parked in front of the gate and we needed to get through. I got out and tapped on the window to ask the driver to move on. Looking in the window, it seemed there were two people fast asleep inside. But when I looked closer, I could see both had been shot. I called Peter over. He peered in the back window and said, There's another one here. The driver was upright with his head bowed onto his chest. The front passenger was in the same position. But the man in the back was slumped sideways. There was blood around his chin, which spilled onto his chest. Last night, murder police battled against cruel weather to save desperately needed clues in the snow. They feared they would lose possible tyre and footprints if a thaw set in. Others called in a low loader to take the Range Rover away with a tarpaulin hiding the bloodied bodies inside. Locals, mainly farm workers used to the sound of shotgun fire, were stunned by the horror. Margaret Lane, who lives nearby, said, It's scary. We're very isolated here. The following newspaper article is from the 9th of December 1995 with the headline Gun Deaths No Leah Link. The detective leading the hunt for the killer who shot three men on an isolated Essex farm track last night dismissed rumours of a link with the Leah Betch tragedy. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley of Essex Police 
confirmed that all three were quite high up in the drug dealing hierarchy, but warned that speculation on a link with Leah's death might hinder the investigation. Last night, police were continuing to hunt for clues with a fingertip search of the area around the murder scene at White House Farm Rettenden near the A130 Chelmsford to South End Road. The bodies of Craig Rolfe, Patrick Tate and Anthony Tucker were found at about 8am on Thursday, something a Range Rover on the snow-covered farm track. Donna Jaggers, Rolfe's girlfriend for seven years and the mother of his six-year-old child, appealed for people to help catch the killer or killers. She wept as she pleaded, quote, I would just like anyone who is with them, who knows anything about what happened, or if they saw anything, to just come forward. Police had earlier visited the parents of Leah Betts, the 18-year-old who died after taking ecstasy, to keep them abreast of developments. But after intense media speculation that the triple killing might be linked with Leah's death, Detective Superintendent Dibley said, quote, at this moment in time, there is nothing to suggest that these men distributed drugs to Leah Betts or her associates. All three men, he said, were well known to the police, having been convicted of armed robbery, vehicle theft and other offences. And although none of them had been convicted for drug offences, all were known to be quite high up in dealing in all kinds of substances. Detective Superintendent Dibley said police could well be looking for more than one killer. But last night, a weapons expert confirmed that spent shotgun cartridges found at the scene had all come from the same gun. Quote, there could be a power struggle or there could be a double cross which has taken place. Detective Superintendent Dibley added, it might be that someone has owed money but hasn't paid their bill. He said Rolf was last seen at 6pm the evening before the bodies were found. He had failed to meet Miss Jaggers for a meal two hours later, fueling speculation that the men were killed on Wednesday evening. Rolf, 26, from Grays, and Tucker, 38, from Fobbing, both died from shotgun wounds to the head. Tate, 37, from Basildon, died of shotgun wounds to the head and torso. The following newspaper article comes from the 9th of December, 1995, with the headline, High Life of Flash Tony. Neighbours of victim Tony Tucker were baffled at how he could afford a £250,000 home and a string of flash motors with no visible means of support. They suspected he was a shady character, but had no idea that he had amassed a fortune from his years at the heart of the Essex underworld. His murder stunned residents in the village of Fobbing, where the gangster owned a hacienda-style bungalow with breathtaking views across open farmland. Tucker's palatial red brick home boasts its own stables. In the front garden is a statue of a naked goddess and Greek urns adorn the front wall. Tucker had a separate garage block for the luxury motors which were often spotted in his drive. These included at least one Mercedes. Neighbours said the drug baron had only recently moved into the house. Tucker appeared paranoid about security. He had an elaborate wall built and iron gates installed to block access to the front of the property. A sophisticated video intercom system was also fitted to vet callers, and after dark, guard dogs patrolled the ground. The detective leading the murder hunt said that Tucker had good reason to fear for his safety. Chief Superintendent Ivan Dibley said of the three victims, these men had been involved with a sort of criminality where it is likely that their lives had been threatened before. Post-mortem examinations were being carried out on the bodies yesterday at Broomfield Hospital Chelmsford. Mr. Dibley appealed for more information from the public. He said, quote, I'd particularly like to hear from anyone who saw a vehicle leaving the farm track at White House Farm or anybody who saw someone thumbing a lift on the A130, which runs past the farm at the relevant time. Mr. Dibley confirmed that the three men arrested on Thursday on suspicion of being connected with the shootings had been released without charge. The next article comes from the same date, the 9th of December, 1995 with the headline, Gun Deaths, No Leah Link. The detective leading the hunt for the killer who shot three men on an isolated Essex farm track last night dismissed rumours of a link with the Leah Betch tragedy. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley of Essex Police confirmed that all three were quite high up in the drug dealing hierarchy, but warned that speculation on a link with Leah's death might hinder the investigation. Last night, police were continuing to hunt for clues with a fingertip search of the area surrounding the crime scene at White House Farm Rettenden near the A130 Chelmsford to South End Road. The bodies of Craig Rolfe, Patrick Tate and Anthony Tucker 
were found at around 8am on Thursday, slumped in a Range Rover on the snow-covered farm track. Donna Jaggers, Rolf's girlfriend of seven years and the mother of his six-year-old child, appealed for people to help catch the killer or killers. She wept as she pleaded, I would just like anyone who was with them, who knows anything about what happened or if they saw anything, to just come forward. Police had earlier visited the parents of Leah Betts, the 18-year-old who died after taking ecstasy, to keep them abreast of developments. But after intense media speculation that the triple killing might be linked with Leah's death, Detective Superintendent Dibley said, At this moment in time, there is nothing to suggest that these men distributed drugs to Leah Betts or her associates. All three men, he said, were well known to the police, having been convicted of armed robbery, vehicle theft and other offences. And although none of them have been convicted for drug offences, all were known to be quite high up in dealing in all kinds of substances. Detective Superintendent Dibley said, police could well be looking for more than one killer. But last night a weapons expert confirmed that spent shotgun cartridges found at the scene had all come from the same gun. There could be a power struggle, or there could be a double cross which has taken place. Detective Superintendent Dibley added, it might be that someone has owed money, but hasn't paid their bill. He said Rolf was last seen at 6pm the evening before the bodies were found. He had failed to meet Miss Jaggers for a meal two hours later, fueling speculation that the men were killed on Wednesday evening. Okay, so an incredibly important piece of information to talk about regarding this article. Now, bearing in mind, this article was published on the 9th of December, so 48 hours after the bodies of Tucker Tate and Rolf were discovered. Now, already, just two days after that discovery of the bodies, a weapons expert, a ballistic expert, has deciphered that only one weapon was used to kill Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Now, this is one of the bigger sticking points for me in this entire investigation, because it's falsely peddled and pushed out there in various books or documentaries that Michael Steele fires his own gun. He fires a shot into one of these victims, at least one shot into these victims. His gun then falls apart. Jack Wombs has his own separate shotgun, during which time he is also shooting the individuals in this car, telling us quite clearly and falsely that two shotguns were used in this crime. Now let me make this crystal clear to you because it's absolutely imperative that you understand what has been falsely put out there in these books and documentaries regarding the use of two shotguns in this crime. It is stated in these books and documentaries that Michael Steele discharges his weapon shooting at least one of these individuals before the gun falls apart. It is never said that Michael Steele clicks the trigger on the first occasion and that gun then jams and falls apart, leaving only one shotgun to kill all three individuals. It's always falsely claimed that Michael Steele has shot one of these individuals before that gun falls apart. Now, the reason it's falsely claimed in these documentaries that the gun fell apart during the execution or after he had fired at least one shot into the victims is because this is exactly what Darren Nichols said during his statement under oath. It clearly states here, Jack said, yeah, it was quite funny because when Mick had shot one of them, the gun fell apart. Now, this is where it comes from. This is where this information arises from. Darren Nichols' own version of events of Michael Steele discharging his weapon and then it falling apart. Now, if you need further clarification that only one shotgun was used for this entire murder, take a look at the summing up in court document where the ballistic expert states the following. All seven cartridge cases had been fired using the same weapon probably a pump or self-loading gun having a large capacity magazine. He could not discount the use of a gun with a lesser magazine capacity that would have required reloading. And I guess whilst we're on the topic of false information, it's probably best to look at the rear near side smashed window. Now, in recent documentaries, it's been surmised or it's been stated actually as a fact that Tate, in fear, smashes the rear window with his fist or some part of his body because he's trying to escape from the vehicle. Now, that's completely false. When we look at the summing up in court document again, the sample of hair from Tate, the backseat passenger, indicated that the shots which caused the injury to his head, the actual injury, had actually passed through the glass prior to causing the injury. The only broken glass was, of course, on the near side rear. 
Now, further on in that document, it talks about um, fragments of glass being found in his hair. That's how they knew that the bullet passed through the glass. And also there was no marks, no scratches, no scuffs on his hands, which you would have expected to have seen if he'd smashed that window with his bare fists. This sort of information is put out there factually, um, really just to make the story sound a bit more interesting. You know, Tate in a, in, a, in a pure panic, smashes the rear window, making a feeble attempt at escape. It's completely false. This window was smashed because it was shot through into Tate's head. Now putting the documentaries, books and films to one side for a moment, for me personally, the most concerning point regarding the use of one or two shotguns is the fact that Darren Nichols clearly states, and he's never changed this version of events, he clearly states that two shotguns were fired in these executions. Yet never during the police investigation, the police interviews, is Darren Nichols ever pulled up on this fact. He's never asked, well, there's only one shotgun being used in this crime, Darren. Why would Michael Steele say that he fired a weapon when he couldn't have possibly have done so? Because Jack Holmes is also there with his shotgun shooting the individuals as well. Not once is it ever put to Darren Nichols that this point of his story absolutely makes no credible sense whatsoever. Now, I could maybe understand if the police didn't get this information until months later in the investigation. But clearly, in this article here, December the 9th, two days after the bodies are discovered, they're given the information by the forensic experts that only one gun fired these rounds. Yet they're still looking at potentially more than one gunman. The next newspaper article comes from the 11th of December, 1995, with the headline, Police warn of gang war after drug murders. Police investigating the murder of three drug dealers on a remote Essex farm track fear more violence could erupt as rival gangs try to move into the area. Yesterday, as further details emerged of the criminal careers of the three victims, Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley warned that the murders could trigger a turf war. I know that when three people who are involved in drug dealing are taken from the scene, somebody will try to fill the void that is created, he said. I anticipate because of that there will be a power struggle taking place and potentially there could be more violence. The dead men, Craig Rolfe, 26, Patrick Tate, 37 and Tony Tucker, 38, all from the Basildon area, have been involved in a range of crimes from petty theft to armed robbery. But recent intelligence had shown that they were moving into the drugs trade as wholesalers rather than street traders. They were, said Mr Dibley, quite high up on the drug dealing hierarchy, peddling the complete range of illegal narcotics. However, Mr Dibley ruled out any direct connection with Leah Betts, the teenager who died after buying an ecstasy tablet at a Basildon nightclub. There has been a lot of speculation that the killings are linked with the tragic death of Leah Betts. This is pure speculation. There is nothing to link these three men with Leah's death, and this suggestion may well divert attention from the real investigation. Mr Dibley said that the men had been threatened. Quote, the drugs world is a very murky world. There has been so much publicity in recent weeks. It is clearly easy money, and it is known that there are power struggles among dealers. Police are unclear why the men were murdered. One theory is that they were killed by a rival gang trying to prevent them muscling in on a lucrative trade. Quote, there are no signs that any attempt was made to escape from the car. These people were more than street dealers, and it may be that others were trying to prevent them getting into a greater position of power. An alternative police theory was that the deaths of the three men who worked together were linked to an unpaid debt. The post-mortem examination results confirmed that the three men were killed with a shotgun. Seven cartridges were found in the snow close to the car. Rolf, who was in the driver's seat of his Range Rover, and Tucker, who was sitting alongside him, were both shot in the head. Tate, who was in the back seat, died of multiple gunshot wounds. Police are not sure whether the killer arrived in the Range Rover with his victims and if he had an accomplice. Mr Dibley, who said that there was no evidence of a struggle in the car, said, I suspect that these shootings were carried out very quickly. There are no signs that any attempt was made to escape from the car. The post-mortem examination, which was carried out more than 24 hours after the bodies were found at the remote track in Rettenden, was unable to confirm the time of death. But Mr Dibley said Rolf failed to make a rendezvous with his girlfriend Donna Jaggers at 6pm on Wednesday. OK, so just a couple of things to pick up on regarding this article. The first thing I guess to mention is the new intelligence they'd received that these individuals were entering the drugs market as wholesalers, not just simple street dealers. 
and the mentioning of an unpaid debt. Now, we know about the Dud Cannabis deal, the money borrowed from certain people, but what I find most interesting is this is appearing in tabloid papers just a few days after these bodies were discovered. Now, I do wonder sometimes exactly what Tucker's next move would have been had he not been killed on December the 6th. Did they plan eventually to cut steel out of the importation situation, therefore raising their own personal profits on all the deals? Were they going to find some way of importing these drugs themselves? Because I guess that's the impression that we get, isn't it, of these three individuals? They're money hungry, they're greedy, they're kind of ruthless. Now, would that have been picked up on by the bigger suppliers, the bigger wholesalers in London regarding their sort of quick expansion into not just street dealing, but now wholesaling these drugs? Was the next plan, the next step up on the ladder for Tucker to actually import these drugs himself? The next newspaper article comes from the 14th of December 1995 with the headline, Fears of Reprisal on Drug Killings. A top Essex detective warned yesterday that there could be reprisals after the slaughter of three suspected drug dealers. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley said after the inquest opened on the three men, I think there is a real chance that there could be repercussions. The killings had left a vacuum in the drugs distribution network in the county. It will be filled very quickly because there is big money to be made. Mr Dibley said, I believe the criminal fraternity in Essex are now looking over their shoulders. Regarding the weapon that was used in these killings, Mr Dibley said that the gun would have been only six inches away from each man when it was fired. The weapon has not been found and he admitted the chances of finding it were slim. We are now in contact with other forces who have had drug related killings, he said. Certainly nowhere else in this country has seen three people killed in this way. Detectives believe that whoever killed the three was in the Range Rover with them. Mr Dibley said that the killer must have been very cool to act the way he did. It was likely that a second vehicle, driven by an accomplice, must have been near the scene. At the inquest, which was opened and adjourned to a date to be fixed, Coroner's Officer PC Derek Seal said that all three men had been identified by fingerprints. Mr Dibley said that the shots had been fired very quickly. It is believed that each of the victims was shot once and then the killer fired again to finish them off. At the inquest, coroner Dr Malcolm Weir said, although the victims were somewhat unsavoury, they were human. Mr Dibley said, we are going all out to identify the person responsible. A lot of people would say that nobody's going to miss them, but the person who has done this to these three men in some ways is worse than them. Society demands that I investigate this as thoroughly as possible to bring whoever is responsible to justice. Okay, so just one point that I wish to make regarding this article, um, and it's something that just makes me feel a bit uneasy when I read it for some reason. Now, we've gone through quite a few articles, many of which are from the day after the bodies were discovered. Some articles were from two days after the bodies were discovered. And already there, we're talking about a gunman, a potential accomplice with a car parked nearby, etc. But now we're one week into the investigation, and eerily, the lead detective, Detective Inspector Ivan Dibley, has come out and said that he believes that whoever committed this crime travelled down there in the Range Rover, which Michael Steele supposedly did. He had an accomplice, which, which Jack Wohm supposedly was. And we also have a third person parked nearby in a getaway vehicle, which I guess was supposedly Darren Nichols. Now, we're seven days into this investigation and already we have exactly how it actually panned out with Jack Wohm's Michael Steele and Darren Nichols being described here in this newspaper article. Now bear in mind, the forensic evidence that we have at this stage, the ballistic evidence we have at this stage, is that one shotgun was used, we have no footprints entering or exiting the crime scene, and no tire tracks. Yet the way that the investigation is going, or the direction that it's heading in, is that we have a possible person traveling down there in the Range Rover with the victims, we have an accomplice waiting down the lane, and someone else parked in a getaway vehicle nearby. Does that ballistic and forensic evidence point to that as the most likely possibility? Jailed gangster Pat Tate gave teenage girls keep fit lessons in a local gym, then lured them back for sexy workouts in his prison cell. The push-up youngsters were a pushover for Tate when he was serving time for armed robbery in Spring Hill Open Prison Bucks. It was a typical stunt by the swaggering hard man, who believed he was destined to be a Mr Big in the seedy world of drug smuggling. 
but he pushed his luck once too often and ended with his brains blown out on a snow-covered Essex farm track. Two pals died with him, victims of a cannabis deal that went wrong. The six foot two, 18 stone bodybuilder found the easy regime of Spring Hill very much to his liking. He organized booze parties in the cells and even set up lucrative drug deals with associates on the outside. A prison source said, quote, Pat got a job as a gym orderly, which meant that he could get special leave to go out and organize workout sessions. He was a very fit man as well as being extremely good looking and the girls loved him. He would really put them through their paces. He returned to prison with a group of girls who were very pretty and had lovely figures. The girls went into the prison and they had some booze with them. I think the officers knew what was going on, but people didn't want to really mess with him. Pat enjoyed sex and he seemed to get it as often as he wanted. You'd never have known he was serving time in prison. Sex and money were the driving forces behind the astonishing rise and fall of 37-year-old Tate the news of the world can reveal. Pretty blonde Lizzie Fletcher, who was dating Tate at the time he was killed, said, quote, Being with Pat was just remarkable. I would walk into a nightclub with him and everybody would move out the way. The pair often went to Raquel's night spot in Basildon, Essex. Lizzie22 said, quote, I felt as though I had the words Pat Tate stamped on my forehead. Everybody would be looking at us. He had this way with people. They all respected him. It was a great feeling being with Pat. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. Another female pal said, quote, Pat had a tremendous personality and he looked gorgeous. Women would just fall at his feet and he had no shortage of offers. He often had a string of girls around him, but Lizzie was his favourite. One of Tate's former drug dealers, Kevin Sees, told how the hard man ran a lucrative vice trade in South End, Essex. He said, quote, Tate controlled South End and this meant drugs, hookers and most of the clubs. He would give the girls drugs and then send them out to meet clients. They would do anything for him. Tate made thousands of pounds out of his girls and he was well known for the services he could supply. They really doted on him and every now and then he would sleep with them. In the end, most of the girls relied entirely on him for their drugs. An underworld source said, quote, South End was Pat's manor and no one worked there without his permission. He had dozens of girls working for him. Many of them were call out girls who met clients, but Tate also had girls set up in flats and he would take a cut of their earnings. He often had parties and there was always plenty of girls to go round. He did like girls because it suited his image. C's 28, who is now going straight, said that Tate once threatened to kill him in a row over drug money. He added, quote, when I heard he was dead, I did cartwheels. He was a madman who would stop at nothing. Tate's ambition to be a top criminal was born in prison. A source said, quote, Before Tate knew prison life, he was just a hard man, an uncut diamond. But he learned a whole lot when he was inside. People he met in prison used Tate's menace to get what they wanted. But he soon realised he didn't need them. He could do it himself. Tate even scoffed at legendary gangsters of the past. He dismissed the murderous Cray twins as a pair of silly little men. The muscle-bound giant was so feared by some prison guards that he ordered them about. Once he fled to Gibraltar after doing a runner from a courtroom and had to be extradited back. Even then, his guards allowed him to pop home and see his girlfriend as he was taken back to custody. The source said, quote, Tate was given too much of a free run inside. Prison should be a deterrent, but for him it encouraged him to be a more professional villain. Tate lived life on the edge. Girlfriend Lizzie Fletcher recalled how he once smashed a pal's Porsche 928S sports car into a set of iron railings in South End, Essex. The car was a write-off, but Lizzie escaped injury. Tate was high as a kite on drugs, but police released him on bail. Tate once persuaded Lizzie and a group of girls to join him and pal Craig Rolfe on a trip to Ostend. But what the girls didn't realise was that they had been set up as unwitting couriers for thousands of pounds of the drug baron's ill-gotten gains. Meanwhile, Tate and Rolf got high and amused themselves by smashing up an Ostend hotel. Lizzie said, quote, I don't regret knowing Pat. I had a great time. Tragically, the same can't be said for the thousands of youngsters who fell foul of the drug baron's evil trade in death and destruction. The following newspaper article is from the 31st of the 1st, 1999, with the headline, I'm the Supergrass Who Doesn't Exist. I'm the Supergrass Who Doesn't Exist. I turned in two killers, now there's a £500,000 bounty on my head. 
Officially, he no longer exists. He doesn't have a national insurance number, a passport, a driving license or a bank account. He still lives with his wife and children, but none of them will ever see their friends again. Their only contact with relatives is the occasional letter passed on by the police. Darren Nichols is a supergrass. His evidence was crucial in convicting the two drug barons responsible for the Essex Range Rover murders three years ago. He may have escaped prison, but he still faces a life sentence, living far away from his home in rented accommodation and surviving on just £48 a week dole money. Every day he has to live with the fact that as one of Britain's most wanted informers, he has a £500,000 price on his head. Just one slip, one telltale clue, could put gangland executioners on the trail of him and his family. He said, quote, I've heard I'm supposed to be out in South Africa and I've got a suntan. The reality is nothing like that at all. They never give you a villa abroad and most countries won't take you because you're a criminal. They take away your national insurance number and your driving license is erased. They take you off the computers, they just vanish you. Everything is a constant lie. I've been offered a few silly jobs but I can't take them. I don't exist. I haven't got a bank account. You get the basic dole money, they find you somewhere to live, and then you're expected to just get on with your life. But it's really awkward. People living near me are starting to wonder. I don't think I'll ever be rid of this. Nichols' crucial testimony at the Old Bailey led to Michael Steele and Jack Wombs being jailed for life for the execution of rival drug barons Pat Tate, 37, Tony Tucker, 38, and Craig Rolfe, 26. He drove the getaway car after Steele, 55, and Wombs, 36, lured their three rivals to an isolated field near Basildon, Essex, after promising them a share in a cocaine drop. When the three men arrived in their Range Rover, they were blasted to death. Nichols said he had no idea what was happening. He said, quote, I assumed that I was driving to a drug deal between Mick and Jack and the men in the Range Rover, and that when they'd completed the deal, they would call me on the mobile and I'd pick the pair of them up. When I was phoned to come and collect them, I drove into the lane and turned the car around to face back towards the road. Jack got in the back, and then Mick got in and the interior light on the car came on. That's when I noticed Jack was wearing white gloves covered in blood. Mick told me to get going. As soon as I started to pull away, Mick started passing the barrels of the gun over to Jack. I thought, fucking hell, what's going on here? Mick said, they won't mess with us again, and that's when I realised somebody had been killed. During last year's trial, the court heard how Steele described himself as the angel of death and boasted that he had done the world a favour. Nichols said, quote, I don't remember a lot about the journey back. As far as I was concerned, it passed in two seconds. It was probably half an hour. I just couldn't comprehend what had happened. I tried to forget it and went into a pub and had a bit to drink. The next day I went back to work. I just tried to carry on as normal, but it was no way I could. In the days that followed, Nichols became increasingly wary of the men that he had first met in jail while serving time for counterfeiting. He said, quote, They realised that I was a weak link, but they got more friendly towards me. They wanted me to do things with them. They wanted to go flying. Mick was egging me on to come flying and betting me that I couldn't identify my town from an aeroplane, things like that. He said, we'll go flying, me and you. And then he turned up, it was him and Jack. He said, Jack could just sit in the back. I thought, there's no fucking way I'm going up in a plane with these two. It was not long afterwards that Nichols, whose story is told in BBC One's Inside Story, decided to tell everything he knew while being quizzed about drugs offences. His wife, who has not been named for security reasons, said, quote, It must have been around midnight when I got a call from Darren. He asked if I wanted to be with him, and I said, of course. He said he couldn't tell me anything, that I should pack an overnight bag for me and the kids, and if we did what he asked, we would be all right. The police turned up some time later. The children were asleep. I had to get them out of bed. I can't remember what I told them about where we were going, but they were so sleepy, they didn't really take much notice. Choking back the tears, she added, I remember thinking I'm probably not coming back here. I don't know why I knew, but I just did. Mrs Nichols and her children were moved between safe houses as they waited for the trial to start. Nichols was first kept at a secure unit in Bedford and was then moved to a wing on the Isle of Wight. Mrs Nichols added, quote, I was like a prisoner. I couldn't go out. I had to rely on a policewoman to take me to the shops. Most of the time, me and the children just sat in the house. We had a television and one sofa. My family couldn't visit. They didn't know where I was. They weren't allowed to know. I was scared. I didn't know what was going on. I had panic buttons and alarms all over the place. There were armed police. The stress got too much for Mrs Nichols. She phoned her husband and told him that if he wasn't with her within a week, she was going home. But the police would not let her leave. They told me I was in danger, she said. 
They said Mick and Jack had lots of contacts in the underworld. They knew dangerous people. They said, you can't go home, you're putting your children in danger. And if you do that, they could be taken away from you. So that was that. Nichols said, my wife was having a breakdown on the phone and all I could do was sit there. But despite all the anguish his family has been put through, former drug runner Nichols says he has no regrets. Of all the supergrasses in the system, I'm the tops, he boasted. I'm considered a major witness. The police really do feel that everyone wants me dead. There's a bounty on my head. I'm not sure how much it is. Some say it's 250,000, others say half a million. But who's going to collect it? Who do you collect it from? At the trial, I tried not to look at Wombs and Steel. They scared me because of what I was doing to them. Obviously, they hate me. I don't think I'll ever be rid of them. Mick's quite old and hopefully he'll die in prison. And Jack, hopefully when he gets out, will be older and wiser and will just get on with his life rather than try to have his revenge. If their sentences are quashed, I'm particularly worried about what will happen. No one likes the truth, especially the families of the people who did it. But it's something they've got to come to terms with, not me. The family of Jack Wombs, who has last week refused leave at a High Court appeal against the sentence, deny any knowledge of a price on Nichols' head. Wombs' brother John said, We need him alive because he is the only witness who can prove that Jack didn't do it. But former detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who headed what turned out to be the biggest ever murder inquiry in Essex, has no doubt that Nichols is telling the truth. Quote, it would be almost impossible for somebody like Darren Nichols to actually make up the detail that he gave in court. But whatever happens to Wombs and Steele, Nichols still has to come to the terms with being a prisoner, probably for the rest of his life. Detectives hunting the gangland killer who fired seven shots into three drug barons from point blank range have yet to make any dramatic breakthrough. Inquiries are continuing and officers are following up leads from the public following massive publicity surrounding the triple murder last week. The family and friends of the three drug dealers, Patrick Tate, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon, Anthony Tucker, 38, of High Road, Fobbing, and Craig Rolfe, 26, of Calshot Avenue, Chafford 100, were laying low again yesterday. The shooting of Tate at his home in November last year, while he was out of prison on weekend release, is being connected to his murder 13 months later. On that occasion, his injuries were not life-threatening and he was taken to Basildon Hospital. Murder Squad detectives are also considering the possibility of a link between the Rettendon murders and October's shooting of a patient at St Andrew's Hospital Billericay by a man dressed as a clown. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley and his team of 30 officers are no nearer to finding a clear motive for the killings, though they are sure the deaths are connected to some form of gangland warfare. A total of seven shots were fired through a side window of the metallic blue Range Rover at Workhouse Lane, Rettendon, with a pump-action shotgun. Police believed the three men, who had previous convictions for drug offences and armed robbery, would each have been killed by the first shot to the head. Murder Squad detectives say the response to pleas for information is disappointing. They are seeking details about the Range Rover the men were executed in on a farm track at Rettendon near Wickford. The vehicle registration is f 424 NPE. The police would also like to interview anyone who had sightings of people acting suspiciously near the scene between late evening last Wednesday and 8am the following morning. The following newspaper article comes from the 5th of the 9th 1997 with the headline Men Executed in Cold Blood. Three drug barons were executed in cold blood by accomplices after a dispute over a smuggled shipment of poor quality cannabis from the continent an Old Bailey court heard on Tuesday. Patrick Tate, 37, Anthony Tucker, 38 and Craig Rolfe, 26, all from Essex, were assassinated as they waited unsuspecting in a Range Rover on a remote farm track at Rettendon, said Andrew Monday QC prosecuting. They had been lured there on the promise of a substantial future cocaine deal, he alleged, as they sat relaxed inside the vehicle on the cold snowy night in December 1995, they were shot dead by two men, Michael Steele and Jack Wombs, according to prosecution. Quote, With cold and merciless efficiency, Steele and Wombs shot dead the free a number of times through the head, said Mr. Monday. They had been victims of a ruse to get them, and particularly Tate, to a deserted quiet farm track where no one would witness what Steele and his right-hand man Wombs would do, prosecution alleged. 
Wombs, 36, from Brockford, Suffolk, and Steele, 55, from Clacton-on-Sea, have denied murdering the free men from Basildon. As Steele and Wombs left the scene, they began dismantling the guns used. Quote, During the course of those three rapid executions, said Mr. Monday, he added that, perhaps through the awfulness of what they had done, they chillingly had time to laugh at the fact that one of the guns had fallen apart at some stage. What prompted such terrible acts? The answer, it would appear, was a dispute over a consignment of very poor quality cannabis, he told the jury. Dealing in the drugs is not an honourable trade. It is often the province of the double cross, the sting and double dealing. They are all stock in trade for those who deal in drugs. Quote, not for them the protection of the law or going to the local county court to pursue a claim if there is something wrong in a drug consignment they have bought. They are beyond the law, as a result of which the remedies they take are sometimes themselves lawless. Even when a consignment is honest, there is a degree of distrust. It often breeds threats from which there are often acts of violence and from them sometimes the direst of all acts of violence, the killing of someone. Still, Wombs, Corey and others had all been involved in the importation of cannabis, Mr. Monday told the court. Quote, they carried out a very, very lucrative trade. They obtained drugs on the continent almost exclusively in Holland, then smuggled them in on a fast open-top boat to the east coast of this country under the cover of darkness. Mr. Monday added the dead men were not angels, but notwithstanding their past, they had a right to live. Mr. Monday continued. It would appear that still was to say there had been a series of disputes between himself and Mr. Tate over the quality of drugs. Still said he learned that Tate was saying he had not been repaid, although he had. He said he heard that Tate was threatening to make him, Still, beg on his knees and admit he had not been repaid. He would then kill Still. Whether this is accurate does not matter a jot, Mr. Monday told the jury. He alleged that was what Steele had believed, and together with Wombs, they decided they could eliminate that threat once and for all. They planned the executions together, and they kept the details to themselves. Quote, they lured Mr. Tate and his two friends to a meeting on the promise of involving them in a substantial cocaine importation. The story spun was that Steele was to fly in a consignment. He put forward the motion he and others would intercept that consignment, kill the courier if necessary, and take it for themselves. Prosecution said it was a baited hook. Of course, there was never to be such an importation, but Tate bit on the hook. Eight shots were allegedly fired at the trio. The trial continues. The following newspaper article is from the 9th of the 9th, 1997, with the headline, Barron's Horrific Gunshot Injuries. A pathologist told an Old Bailey jury how a drug baron's head exploded when he was ruthlessly gunned down at close range. Tony Tucker was shot three times, twice in the face and once in the back of the head on December the 6th, 1995. He was found dead inside a Range Rover in Rettendon next to the bodies of his friends Pat Tate and Craig Rolfe. Michael Steele, 54, of St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, and Jack Wombs, 36, of Brockford, Suffolk, deny murdering the three men. Paula Lanas, a pathologist for 22 years, told the court there was an extra injury on Mr Tucker's head. She explained it had not been caused by a bullet wound, but by his heavily fractured skull breaking the skin. Miss Lanas said, quote, With an injury like this, the head just explodes. She revealed Mr. Tucker, 38, of High Road Fobbing, would not have been aware his life was in danger. He was found in a relaxed pose with his legs crossed, his hands in his lap and holding a mobile phone. Craig Rolfe, the 26-year-old driver of Calshot Avenue Chafford 100, took two shots to the head, one exiting between his eyes. Pat Tate, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon, was shot once in the head, once in the lower chest, piercing his liver, and he received a superficial flesh wound to his head. John Burns, a forensic scientist who specialises in shotguns, said the weapon had been a 12-bore shotgun, either a pump-action or self-loading model. He found eight separate wounds on the bodies and said the shots had been fired at close range. When he arrived at the murder scene in remote workhouse lane Rettendon, the court heard he noticed blood dripping from the Range Rover, forming puddles on the snowy ground. Then he found seven cartridge cases scattered around. They were all from the same gun. The eighth cartridge has never been recovered. 
Mr. Burns revealed each man was probably shot once to disable or kill them before the rest of the shots were fired. The case continues. Trio lured to their deaths. The three men found murdered in a Range Rover parked in a remote lane off the A130 were known villains from South Essex and could have been victims of a gangland killing. But police refused to comment this morning on speculation that the murders in the quiet village of Rettenden are linked to drug dealing connected with the death of teenager Leah Betts. One of the dead men was Patrick Tate, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon, who had convictions for having cocaine with intent to supply and robbery. The others were Craig Rolfe, 26, of Calshot Avenue, Chafford 100, and Anthony Tucker, 38, of High Road, Fobbing. Tucker was a former bodyguard to boxer Nigel Benn. Murder inquiry detectives are keeping an open mind on the possibility that the men who were discovered at Workhouse Lane yesterday morning were shot point blank by someone from the criminal underworld. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley said, It is a possibility, but there are a number of possibilities. This was no ordinary murder. These men were enticed to their deaths. But a police spokesman, when asked about allegations that the killings were connected to an ecstasy drugs ring, said, We are fully aware of the suggestions being made, but we have nothing new to say at the moment. The killings come just two months after a man dressed in a clown suit shot a patient at St Andrew's Hospital in Billericay, which was another gangland action. The bodies were found by a farmer and his friend as they drove up the snow-covered track near Wickford. The two men in the front were upright with gunshot wounds to the head. The third man was slumped across the back seat. There are no tracks from any other vehicle or footprints leading away from the scene, which is metres from the busy A130. One of the dead men was the known owner of the metallic blue vehicle, though he was not the registered owner. It was bought from Eastern Garages at Five Bells Vange around a month ago and had the registration F424 NPE. Tate was hunted by police for over a year after a daring escape from Billericay Court on a motorbike. He was eventually tracked down in Gibraltar and returned to this country. Police have not recovered the weapon used to shoot the men, who were in casual clothes and were not wearing seatbelts, and they do not know the motive for the killings. Mr Dibley, who is running the investigation with 30 officers, said at a press conference last night, We still don't know the motive, but this may become clearer when we have positively identified these men. The window behind the front passenger seat was broken and shotgun cartridges were found near the scene. The dead men had not been tied or restrained with ropes and there was no sign of a struggle. Mr Dibley added, Whoever killed these three people is clearly a very dangerous man and until we catch him I am concerned that he is at large. Not too many things to add to this particular article, but at the end there it mentions that Detective Inspector Ivan Dibley was incredibly concerned because the man at large he deemed would be very dangerous. Well, considering he supposedly knew who was responsible for this murder within sort of 36 hours of the crime taking place, and then he let this man out on the loose for months until his eventual arrest, I do find that a little bit hard to believe. Anyway, let's continue with the next article. The next article comes from the same date with the headline, Horror on Farm Track, as three men are shot in Range Rover. Three men found dead in a Range Rover are believed to be drug dealers executed by contract killers, it was revealed last night. Detectives think they were lured into an ambush and shot dead as they sat in the vehicle in an Essex country lane. They suspect the killings were the result of a dispute among the drug dealers. All three men are believed to be Essex criminals and the country's coast is among the favoured routes for drug smuggling. The trio were found slumped in their seats shortly before 8am yesterday in the village of Rettenden near Chelmsford by two men who were going to feed pheasants. All three victims, aged between 20 and 40, had been blasted at point-blank range in the back of the head with a shotgun. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who is leading the murder hunt, said they had yet to be formally identified but were thought to be known criminals. Quote, this is not an ordinary murder by anyone's standards, he said. It looks as if they had been enticed down there, or maybe an arrangement had been made for them to be down there. He said he was unsure whether more than one person was responsible. One window on the metallic blue F-registered Range Rover had been smashed, and police believed the men were shot where they sat, two in the front seats and one in the back. 
Forensic experts search for clues and a weapon under a fresh fall of snow in the undergrowth surrounding the lane, which leads off the A130 Chelmsford to South End Road. Bricklayer Kenneth Jiggins and his friend farmer Peter Theobald stumbled on the scene as they went to feed Mr Theobald's pheasants. Mr Jiggins, 47, from South Woodham Ferrers said, I got out of the car to tap on the Range Rover to ask them to move it. There was no response. I called back to Peter and he said, There's too many in here. They've been shot and it looks like they're dead. There was blood on their faces and chests. Mr Theobald, 44, who owns nearby White House Farm, noticed a third man in the back seat. It was fairly obvious what had happened. He said it was pretty shocking. For all the world, it looked like they were just asleep in the car. It wasn't until you looked closer that you could see they'd been shot. The Range Rover, with the bodies still inside, was transported by truck from the scene to Broomfield Hospital Mortuary in Chelmsford. Last night, the bodies were still in the car. They were being examined by Home Office pathologist Dr Paula Lanas. The next newspaper article comes again from the same date, with the heading, Gangland Clue to Men Shot Dead in Range Rover. Three men were shot in the head as they sat in a car after apparently being lured to a remote farm track in Essex. The men, thought to be criminals, were found shortly before 8am yesterday. A farmer and his friend were going to feed their pheasants at White House Farm Rettenden near Chelmsford when they discovered the blue seven-year-old Range Rover with the men slumped inside. The identities of the men, all believed to come from South Essex, and details of their previous convictions were not disclosed. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who is leading the investigation into what is believed to be a gangland killing, said it was not an ordinary murder. It appears that they were enticed to go down the lane or an arrangement was made for them to be there. Shotgun cartridges were found in the snow near the car, which was parked 250 yards down Workhouse Lane. The track runs from the main south end of Chelmsford Road to a private fishing lake. Police believe that the men were shot at point blank range in the car. The murderer, possibly with an accomplice, is then understood to have driven away. We don't know if we are looking for one perpetrator or two, Mr Dibley said. We also don't know whether somebody arrived in the same vehicle as the victims or came in their own. The track in which a hijacked lorry was dumped several years ago was so narrow that police were unable to take the bodies from the Range Rover to carry out a post-mortem examination. Instead, the men, all white and aged between 20 and 40, were left inside the car. The vehicle was covered with a green tarpaulin and taken to South Woodham Ferrers for examination six hours after the bodies were found. Peter Theobald, the farmer who found the bodies, and his friend Ken Jiggins, a bricklayer, thought that the Range Rover belonged to fishermen when they saw it blocking the track. Quote, We were driving down the farm track to feed the birds, Mr Jiggins 44 said. The Range Rover was parked close to a locked gate which leads to the lake. We thought that perhaps it was a fisherman, but they all have their own keys. I got out, walked up to the Range Rover and tapped on the window and told them to move it. There was no response. I looked in and then walked back to Peter and told him that there are two people in there who by the looks of it had been shot dead. Peter got out of the car, walked up to the vehicle and he looked inside and said, there's one in the back as well. We got hold of the police and told them what we had seen. People living nearby said they had heard nothing on Wednesday night or early yesterday morning. Ron Foe, owner of Rettenden Hall said, we are shooting people. It would not be that unusual to hear guns at night. People go lamping for rabbits and foxes. We're into shotguns, but we heard nothing. Okay, just a couple of things to pick up on regarding this statement. I guess the first thing to remember is that this is still incredibly early on. This article was published on December the 8th. So the information that the reporter got for this actual article probably would have been gained on December the 7th, the day that the bodies were discovered. But already we're hearing talk from Detective Inspector Ivan Dibley that the person who committed this triple murder may have had a possible accomplice. They may have actually arrived in the Range Rover and then drove away in their own vehicle, which actually turned out, according to the official narrative, to be the truth. Jack Wombs and Michael Steele were down the lane whilst Darren Nichols was waiting in a car nearby. I guess you need to ask yourself, would that be one of the first things that you would consider as an investigator in this case? Bearing in mind this is the first day that the bodies were discovered, would you naturally believe or even consider that someone may have travelled down there in the Range Rover? What would make you believe that there was a car parked close by if you didn't see any footprints entering or exiting the lane itself when the first responding officers attended that crime scene? 
they certainly didn't actually mention or spot any sign of anyone walking up to the Range Rover or away from this Range Rover. What would give you the impression that there would be a car parked nearby in order to make their escape? You could say that would be pure common sense, but it was not actual any forensic or physical evidence to point in that direction. Another snippet of information which is mentioned in this article is the fact that the low loader was used in order to take the Range Rover away with the bodies inside because apparently the lane was too narrow in order to remove the bodies there and then and conduct a safe post-mortem. It also states that the bodies were taken away around six hours after they were discovered. And that's what I mean when I state at the beginning of this video that all of these articles will give you a similar background as in a Range Rover was found with three dead individuals inside. But each article adds a little piece of additional information. The next article is again from the same date, the 8th of December 1995, with the headline, Murdered Drugs Men Linked to Leah Death. Three men found dead in a Range Rover in a gangland-style murder were today revealed to be ecstasy barons suspected of providing the drug to tragic Leah Betts. Patrick Tate, Craig Rolfe and Anthony Tucker were shot in the head at Point Blank Range after apparently being lured to a remote farm track near the village of Rettenden, Essex, possibly to discuss a drug deal. Their bodies were found in a blood-splattered seven-year-old metallic blue Range Rover early yesterday on a snowy track four miles from Leah's home in Latchingdon, outside Chelmsford. Murder Squad detectives said all were known criminals and police sources today confirmed that they had been involved in ecstasy dealing in local nightclubs like Raquel's in Basildon, where Leah bought a fatal ecstasy tablet on her 18th birthday last month. Tate, 37, from Basildon, was known as a hardened criminal who punched his way out of a court seven years ago as he was due to stand trial on robbery and drug possession charges. The bodies were discovered at 8am yesterday by farmer Peter Theobald and his friend Ken Jiggins on their way to feed pheasants on the remote, snowy, tree-lined track running across bleak open farmland. Shotgun cartridges were found scattered in the snow. Detective Chief Superintendent Ivan Dibley said he believed the men were shot in the car and that the killer would have escaped in a vehicle of his own. I don't know if we are looking for one perpetrator or two, he added. Whoever has killed three people clearly is a very dangerous man. To that extent, until such a time we catch him, I am concerned that he is at large. Extra police officers were today drafted in as the hunt was stepped up. Mr Jiggins, a 44-year-old bricklayer, told how he stumbled across the car on the lonely track known locally as Workhouse Lane. It is known as a favourite rendezvous point for criminals and in summer for courting couples. Okay, now in this article, again, Detective Inspector Ivan Dibley is mentioning, quote, that they believed that they would have escaped in their own vehicle. Now, I guess logically, that is the most common occurrence, isn't it? If a triple murder is committed down a, a farm track, then they're going to be looking to get away as quickly as possible. But in a situation and at a location like that, where you have so many different points of entry and exit, and the fact that they didn't actually have any tyre tracks entering or exiting the crime scene itself. I guess it is a bit of a, an assumption to start saying that they would have travelled in their own car, they would have exited or left in their own car, although it probably is, as I say, the most logical explanation. They didn't have any forensic evidence to back that up or to even really lead to that conclusion. It's also worth remembering that when Darren Nichols said that he pulled into this part of the lane here, there were no tyre tracks found matching that vehicle that he claims that he was driving that night. All that we have there is a suspicious high performance tyre. Um, that is the only real suspicious tyre track that is found down the entirety of Workhouse Lane. The next article is again from the 8th of December 1995, with the headline, Free shot dead in drug trap, blown away. Three men were executed in a gangland ambush yesterday, just two miles from a huge drugs drop. Each had been blasted in the head with a shotgun as they sat in their metallic blue Range Rover. One of the victims was a former bodyguard of boxer Nigel Benn, called Tony Tucker. Hardman Tucker was gunned down with two associates after being lured to what detectives believe was a drugs deal down a lonely farm track used by courting couples. Known cocaine dealer Patrick Tate, 37, who also had form for robbery, was another found dead in the blood-splattered Range Rover, with third man Craig Rolfe. 
The trio, unable to turn round in the narrow lane, were trapped like rats when the killers opened fire through the windows of the vehicle. As police searched for clues, footprints and tyre marks in the thawing snow, they were looking at links with a £1 million cannabis haul in and around the nearby pond seven weeks ago. Detectives believed the drugs could have been part of a big shipment lost as it was dropped from a low-flying plane. Or it may have been left by a bungling gang who forgot which pond they hid it in. The track where the blood-soaked Range Rover was discovered in Essex early yesterday led to an isolated fishing lake owned by farmer Peter Theobald of Whitehouse Farm. It was discovered by Mr Theobald and farmhand Ken Jiggins. The cannabis was found scattered at nearby Tanfield Ty in West Hanningfield. Farmer Jan Halstrup, who found it, said he believed the drugs were linked to the killings. Dutch-born Mr Halstrup said, First of all, we found a little parcel of drugs when we were doing some hedges. I put it on the fire. Then we found another piece the size of a video cassette in my pond. Police later recovered a staggering 53 packets of cannabis wrapped in black plastic and weighing 336 pounds. Divers found a further 19 packets. One police officer said, I've never seen anything like this before, it's remarkable. Police are now trying to discover if the killings were connected with a shooting some days ago near a little chef calf when three men were seen running away. The bodies in the Range Rover were found just 300 yards from the busy A130 Chelmsford to South End Road at Rettendon, Essex. The near side rear window had been shot out. Two bodies were in the front of the vehicle and one was in the back. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley said there were no signs of a struggle, suggesting they were surprised by the cold-blooded killers. He added, It looks as if they've been enticed down there, or they may have even arranged to be down there. And he added, The three men are known to us as criminals. They were understood to all come from Essex. The Range Rover had to stop at a five-bar gate, which was locked. On the other side of it were fields leading to the trout pond. Mr Dibley said, The wounds are consistent with wounds from a shotgun. He added, there is quite a lot of blood contained in the vehicle. Mr Dibley said that at least one shotgun was used and the majority of its force was contained inside the vehicle. The condition of the body suggested they had been killed on Wednesday night or early yesterday. All three had been shot through the head. And he added, whoever killed three people are clearly very dangerous and to that extent I am concerned that they are at large. Police who sealed off the area after the bodies were found were carrying out a careful search of the area looking for clues. Post-mortem examinations are due to be carried out today. The killers chose the perfect spot. Viewed from the air yesterday, it became clear that the murder scene was carefully picked out. The Range Rover used in the executions was parked at the only place shrouded by trees on a remote farm track. After the shooting, the killer simply had to walk 200 yards back down the lane to jump into a getaway car waiting on the busy A130. Yesterday, forensic experts were conducting an inch-by-inch -inch search of the track looking for the killer's footprints frozen in the ice. Whoever shot the men probably walked past White House Farm, which borders the track and the A130. The farm is now the centre of police activity. Eight squad cars and a white-painted police instant caravan were parked in the yard. A team of six police officers could be seen carrying out the gruesome task of examining the area immediately around the Range Rover which was left near a gate which blocks the track. Officers were picking through six inches of snow and mud looking for cartridges from the shotgun. Fragments of glass from a window shattered by the gun blasts were also being recovered in the hope they may hold some clue to the identity of the gunman. Policemen believe that they may have been injured by flying glass and could have left traces of blood. The next newspaper article comes again from the 8th of December 1995 with the headline Ecstasy Barons are executed in Lane. Three men shot dead in a gangland-style execution in a lover's lane were high-level drug dealers but had no known link with tragic teenager Leah Betts, the officer leading the inquiry into the killing said this afternoon. Media speculation about any link with the case of Leah, who died after taking an ecstasy tablet and collapsing at her 18th birthday party, might divert attention from the murder inquiry, said the man leading the hunt. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley. The scene is just a few miles from where Leah lived, but Mr Dibley told a news conference there was nothing to suggest at the moment that they distributed drugs to Leah or her associates. Newspaper reports today had said that the three were suspected of being involved in supplying the drug to Leah, who is thought to have obtained it at a Basildon nightclub. 
Police earlier today visited Leah's parents. The teenager's father is a former police inspector to keep them abreast of the situation, said an Essex police spokeswoman. Now, what we do know for a fact is that what Detective Inspector Ivan Dibley has said here to the public is completely false. He himself, as well as the Essex police, knew full well that Tony Tucker was the man who supplied the ecstasy tablet to Leah Betts. And it's kind of ironic at the end of this interview that they mentioned that the police even attend Leah Betts' parents' home the day after the discovery of the bodies to keep them abreast of the situation. Now, if they had no connection with Tony Tucker, then why the hell would they be telling them any information regarding these triple murders? Many thanks for joining me in this episode. You will be able to see in front of you shortly some other videos from the channel, so feel free to work your way through those. And also the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. I look forward to seeing you all again in the next video. Take care. Cheers.